cardiac interventions. So please join us on uh, Thursday. And then on Friday, Dr. Anderson is going to talk about discordant AV connections. This is going to be awesome. So that's what we have for this week. And for May, we have a lot of uh, more things uh, uh, to come. So now with you, Gil, and I'm sure this is going to be awesome. Thank you, Gil. Thank you very Grace, much. For I, um, I can never figure out how Sasha chooses the songs that he plays in the morning. I mean, I don't know if Sasha's still on, but that was, you know, very... Um, I know it's late in the afternoon in Rome. Yeah, <laughs> I didn't know. I didn't know that they were as a congenital heart academy. I didn't know they were Italian, Sasha. That, that was uh, was terrific. <laughs> uh, well, I'm really I'm really pleased uh, to be back and speaking on the second part about transposition today. As you may be able to see from my background, it's uh, cherry blossom season here in uh, Washington D.C. Uh, it's absolutely beautiful. The weather is fantastic. Uh, I've got my pink on just to sit with the season. Um, and as you also can see in the background, um, the World Congress of Pediatric Cardiology and Cardiac Surgery, for those of you who don't know, is, uh, is an every four-year event that gets awarded to various countries. The United States was awarded this um, uh, really prestigious meeting uh, at the 2015 meeting in Prague. Uh, we had to postpone because of COVID, uh, unfortunately, but we are now a little, less, a little more than two years away. So August 27th of 2023 will be hopefully a very, very live, in face, no masked, highly attended meeting. I think all of us are a little bit fatigued with Zoom and fatigued with masks and everything like that. And I remain very optimistic that we're going to be able to uh, really put on a great show here in Washington. Uh, the Congenital Heart Academy will be the official, I'm proud to say, distributor of educational content. We're still working out how this will be done virtually. Uh, but we have, um, the scientific committee and myself, have decided that some of the scientific content that was scheduled for this September, which will be somewhat dated by 2023, will start to be presented as a series between the World Society of Pediatric Cardiology and Cardiac Surgery, World Congress, uh, and the Congenital Heart Academy. Uh, at the very least, we will be having the um, newly published deadlines on, uh, guidelines, excuse me, on hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And I spoke with your colleague, Grace, with Ziad Ajazi and the, uh, the new PICS uh, fellowships and the Pediatric Interventional Cath Society, and we will be putting on some uh, live cases and some other things jointly with PICS. We had our first meeting with the Fetal Heart Society and with um, other types of educational uh, symposia through the Congenital Heart Academy's uh, platform, the World Congress of Pediatric Cardiology and Cardiac Surgery and all of the societies. So stay tuned. Uh, our website will be up and running soon. A lot of that delay is happening because of yours truly. Uh, but I will be working on that with Sasha, as I promised you, Sasha, and uh, we'll get our website up and running soon. So without further ado, I'm going to start uh, with, we're going to be talking about transposition of the great arteries today. Um, we had, I thought, a really nice session um, the last time we spoke, but we had so many conversations, I really didn't have enough time to go into all of the things that I wanted to talk about. So uh, we put up this um, uh, separate session today, um, and I hope to take a number of breaks. And Grace, if you could moderate this along with me so I could see where the questions are. Um, I'm going to start out with uh, a brief review of what we talked about last time, uh, and then if there are any questions about that, and then maybe we can take a break in between these um, sessions. sections. So again, very briefly to review preoperative management. Uh, the physiology, um, medical and interventional calf management, and timing of surgery. I'm going to take about 15 minutes to go through that again. Maybe we can take a short break, um, and then we'll uh, start to talk about postoperative care, uh, and then a brief review of some of the longer-term outcomes for people that are not on here that just do uh, hot, not just, but do uh, inpatient care. I was really happy to see in the list of attendees some old friends from Miami, Dr. Traconis, Dr. Tarota. Uh, and some uh, many people that I've known over the years. I wish we could have Zoom pictures of all of us, but it makes the uh, platform very challenging. 
And I know my really good friend, Jeff Bird is on and uh, he'll correct me on anything that I get wrong. So uh, it's good to see your names here, everybody. We only have, uh, looks like about 140 people. So from a Zoom perspective, a relatively small audience. So hopefully we'll get to do a lot of uh, discussion about complicated issues as we move forward. I, this is gonna be very fast. If people are interested in more of the preoperative stuff, I, I invite you to look onto the uh, YouTube channel where we can, uh, where both last symposium on transposition is as well as uh, larger ones that occurred uh, over the fall of last year. Transposition is defined the, as- On the chat box. I oh, thanks. Thanks, Grace. Is that the one from the- um, both. The first so part of the series and, okay. The, your Great. first session and the two big webinars. Oh, beautiful. Thank you, Grace. As you can see, these are very informal sessions and that's the way I, I think they should run. Oh, wait, I promised Grace I would do something here. Hold on one second. I have to do, this is very important. So that should make me official now member of the Congenital Heart Academy. I like that. <laughs> All right, done with, the, done with the Washington thing. So again, anatomically straightforward, the aorta is attached to a right ventricle. The pulmonary artery is attached to an anatomical left ventricle. Uh, there are great sessions from Bob Anderson on all of the anatomic variations here, but we're going to be talking about today is relatively straightforward transposition with an intact ventricular septum or transposition with a ventricular septal defect. And as we talked about last time, the pulmonary artery saturation is greater than the aortic saturation in this disease and only this disease. And the pulmonary and systemic circuits are in parallel rather than in series. I've used this box diagram. I, I more frequently like to draw the diagrams of circulation anatomically correct, but it makes more sense in transposition to do it this way. So on your left is the systemic venous return going into the right atrium through the superior cable vein and the inferior cable vein through the right atrium, the right ventricle and out the aorta. And on your right, the pulmonary veins feed the left atrium and back to the pulmonary artery. As you can see this parallel circulation here. People incorrectly use parallel circulation for single ventricle, and we have uh, time to talk about that at another time. Now, over short periods of time, the amount of blood that goes from the systemic side to the pulmonary side is equal to the amount of blood that goes vice versa. And we know that over time, as pulmonary vascular resistance falls, that gradually increases. So now there is slightly greater pulmonary blood flow, pulmonary vascular resistance further falls, and I've diagrammatically shown that with larger pink boxes. And that process continues to occur to the point that over weeks to months, if we don't do surgery, the pulmonary blood flow is significantly greater than the systemic blood flow. And as that circulation becomes engorged, we see patients uh, develop uh, cardiomegaly, respiratory distress, and other signs of heart failure. Um, we rarely see this anymore because we operate early, and this is usually the case in transposition with, a ventric with some other type of shunt, ventricular septal defect, ductus arteriosus, or both. Another important concept here is that the total flow, let's look on the left with the systemic blood flow over here. The total systemic blood flow does not really contribute to gas exchange. The only part that contributes to gas exchange is this component coming here from the pulmonary circuit over to the systemic circuit. So the total systemic flow is this black circle that I have moving around and around, but only a portion of that is effective. So the effective pulmonary blood flow is this white uh, cartoon arrow here. And the effective pulmonary blood flow, that which is deoxygenated blood with high CO2, contributes to gas exchange here. So as you can see on this bottom diagram, and this is from work Milton Paul did back in the 80s, uh, 
the pulmonary blood flow is significantly greater than the effective flows, but both of those are considerably greater than the effective flows, those which contribute to gas exchange at the tissue level. If there are questions on that, we can get to that in just a little bit. So another thing that I want to clarify and make uh, a big point about, I've heard many people in intensive care units talking about mixing at the ductus arteriosus, and I think that's a not the best term to use for these babies. The only way that you get oxygenated blood to the brain and the coronaries is from the left atrium, through an atrial septal defect, through the right ventricle, and into the aorta. So you need an atrial septal defect to get any oxygenated blood to the brain and to the coronaries. Even in patients with transposition and a ventricular septal defect, there would be no hemodynamic reason for red blood to go from the low resistance left ventricle into the high resistance aorta. So many times patients, even if they have a large VSD, will still be sick until their atrial septal defect has been opened up. So here's our effective systemic flow coming from pulmonary veins to left atrium, to right atrium to aorta, which is less than the total systemic flow, but these arrows represent the effective flow, where the oxygen gets out to the body. So you need this atrial level shunt. The reason a PDA helps these babies is it provides a nearly total left to right or aorta to pulmonary artery shunt. That then fills the pulmonary veins and therefore increases the amount of blood flow coming across the right atrium to the aorta. So again, patients don't mix at the PDA, they shunt at the PDA from aorta, aorta to PA, and because left to right has to equal right to left, you get a larger LA to RA shunt. Next myth that I wanna bust besides um, mixing at the PDA is the fact that a baby is stable on prostaglandin. Uh, and the reality is in every lesion, whether it's structurally normal heart or single ventricle or transposition or anyone with a large unrestricted ductus, which is what prostaglandin gives you, is a progressive degree of heart failure as pulmonary vascular resistance falls. Now, I've heard some people say prostaglandin is bad, but it's actually it's the open ductus, which is physiologically bad over time. Short term, not so bad, but there's an obligate volume load to the heart with diastolic runoff. I'll show you some data on reduced cerebral oxygen delivery to the brain, which is associated with white matter injury, and to the intestine, which is associated with necrotizing enterocolitis. Many surgeons, I don't know how many we have on the webinar today, but I've heard a number of surgeons talk about tissue friability. Um, in babies left on prostaglandin for a long period of time, it's probably edema and water uh, from the heart failure, just like we see in the eyelids and in the, the shins of these babies. Then prostin also has its own problems. Uh, hypotension can occur as it's a pulmonary and systemic vasodilator. It can cause apnea, fever, and a rash. And most intensivists um, like to see those oxygen saturations high, and it's sometimes challenging to get prostaglandin uh, to be stopped. So in diastole, and, and this is work, uh, this is uh, some work that's been done in multiple institutions. You could see that as you look at the Doppler physiology on your left with low pulmonary vascular resistance, all the way over to the right with high pulmonary vascular resistance, you can see that there is increasing flow from the aorta into the pulmonary artery, which basically steals uh, systemic blood flow into the circuit of the pulmonary vascular bed. Um, in addition, so that was at the ductus. This is the middle cerebral artery, uh, some work that's been done out of Bordeaux and published about five years ago. The same uh, Doppler pattern can be seen with low resistance up here at the top with continuous flow in diastole. Um, and I want to show you just one clinical example. These are some slides taken from bedside monitor uh, from a company called Ediometry. Uh, it's called T3, which simultaneously gives you a number of 
uh, recordings of continuous variables. We had a baby recently with transposition intact ventricular septum who was quite hypoxemic was on prostaglandin and had an emergency balloon atrial septostomy. I apologize for all the abbreviations for those of you who are not native English speakers. Uh, developed necrotizing enterocolitis uh, at 48 hours. And we were waiting for the intestines to heal. And uh, I thought it would be a good idea if we stopped the prostaglandin for the reasons that we talked about before. So um, we discontinued uh, the prostaglandin at 3 p.m. <laughs> and as these things tend to be, once the night shift happened is when the sats fell and the ductus opened. Let me show you some of the hemodynamic changes here. So just to orient you, um, at the top is when the prostaglandin was ordered, got from the uh, pharmacy into the bedside. And this uh, red line is the continuous pulse oximetry reading uh, in this baby. And you could see this immediate increase in oxygen saturation shown here, which was the clinical opening of the ductus, which occurred about 15 minutes after we actually resumed it. The baby is in 100% oxygen, which we decreased, as you can see. Um, now, associated with that prostaglandin right here was an increase in the heart rate by almost 20 points, uh, consistent with opening up a left to right shunt. When we looked at the blood pressure, you could see the pulse pressure widened from 68 over 42 to 74 over 35. And we do know that diastolic hypotension might be one of the triggers for both brain uh, and gut injury. And when we looked at the cerebral near infrared spectroscopy, could look at it a couple of different ways that the, the uh, cerebral nears went from 46 to 58. So it went up about 15% about initially. Um, however, if you look at the difference between the arterial and the cerebral nears, that AVDO2 suggesting oxygen extraction increased. And then finally, we had uh, abdominal near infrared spectroscopy and that went down 20%. So heart rate goes up, oxygen saturation goes up, pulse pressure widens, uh, cerebral nears goes up, but the AV difference goes wider and abdominal nears goes down. So what is a better physiologic state here? I think it's a difficult one to say. Simplistically at the bedside with an oxygen saturation of 93% and then down to 83%, you might assume that that baby is better off and he or she might be but it's not as simple as just watching the pulse oximeter go up. Uh, so many units, certainly ours, until I'll show you a new strategy that we have, uh, that we've decided upon in the last few weeks, uh, we'll go back and forth. Do we put prostin on? Do we put prostin off? Do we keep it on? Do we get a so-called prostaglandin dance? Uh, this was just published out of Boston Children's. Um, uh, this is from the anesthesia group, and uh, Vivian Nasser, who's also a, a delegate of the Congenital Heart Academy, uh, published this. And I think it's a very interesting paper where they looked at, from an anesthesiologist's perspective, what happened to the babies that underwent an arterial switch operation. You can show you over here. Large group, 147 who underwent an arterial switch, which they then broke down into urgent and non-urgent. And if you look up this paper, you can download its open access on the web if you're interested. But in particular, if we look at the transposition with balloon atrial septostomy patients, that they tried to take the patients off somewhere around 90 to 100% of the time, the team in the ICU, but only about two thirds of them stayed off prostaglandin by the time they got to the intense, by the time they got to the operating. And again, this wasn't protocolized, but many units will go on again, off again. I think that comfort levels with lower oxygen saturations are more common, say, in my generation than the younger generation. Uh, that's just a speculation on my part. Um, the complications seen by prostaglandin here were the typical ones of hypotension, apnea requiring intubation. Um, and fever. And when I spoke with Vivian about that. So if we look then uh, in the same group, 
So that's the complications of prostaglandin. What about a balloon septostomy? Well, we have vascular trauma uh, in about 2.7%. Um, arrhythmias, as you can see there, cardiac perforation. And interestingly, the patients who got a balloon septostomy went to the OR an average of three days later. That was the so-called stable on prostaglandin. And one of the goals I have for this presentation is to try to make uh, my point that the urgency of an operation in this disease has to be rethought. This is what happens when you leave a catheter in a baby. So it could be a femoral venous catheter, it could be a peripheral IV, it could be the septostomy catheter. The reason these catheters don't bleed, or these um, venipunctures don't bleed, when you take the catheter out as a clot forms. By definition, a clot is going to form uh, along any IV catheter. And that is probably the major reason of stroke in these kids rather than pulling the balloon through the atrial septum itself. Now they're all linked to variables, a big catheter in the, in the femoral vein or umbilical vein and a clot and manipulation and all those sorts of things. But these two large series of nearly 20,000 patients, um, and the data is a little equivocal, but if you look at these two large meta-analysis, there's no question that there's an increased risk of stroke. So then you have to decide, okay, is the risk of the septostomy higher than the risk of not doing the septostomy? And this is complicated stuff. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about timing. And the balloon septostomy and prostaglandin clearly are important parts of management. However, um, and I take this from uh, my friend John Berger that I work with here at Children's National, is you can't fix surgical heart disease with medicine. Transposition is a surgical disease. We know that prostaglandin has risks that we've talked about before that are both related to the medicine and the physiologic risks to the brain and the gut in particular. We know that the septostomy has potential risks, including vessel injury, perforation, and stroke. So how do we balance these things. Um, we balance the risk of how it affects mortality, how it might affect morbidity, uh, how it may affect length of stay, and I'll show you some of this data. So let's take it to the extreme. And this is a wonderful group uh, led by Ilya Yemitz, who spoke at the last congenital heart campus that we had live in Ortiz. It's so long ago now. And the, the group in Kiev in Ukraine have been doing umbilical cord, have been priming cardiopulmonary bypass with umbilical cord blood for many years now and have been reporting on doing arterial switches extremely early in life, certainly within the first 24 hours. And if you haven't seen this data, it's truly remarkable. So 92 middle column, 92 babies who've had an arterial switch less than 24 hours of age um, with a major complication rate of 15%, about the same as later arterial switches shorter amount of uh, ventilation, just a day, uh, and uh, overall length of stay only two weeks. Uh, pretty impressive results, clearly non-inferior to what most of our units get uh, uh, in our, in our uh, current strategies. Uh, I found that very interesting. Most people look at it certainly askance, but it's clearly not um, inferior. And then here's a group from Penza, Russia, which has done very um, similar uh, approaches. And in this group in particular, they've taken very, very sick babies to the operating room rather than doing a septostomy. And very, so they took eight of these 44 patients who were very ill, as you can see by their pH and lactate, no septostomy directly to the OR. There weren't a lot of details about the post-operative course and all, but it certainly can be done even in critically ill patients. Uh, this was a, a paper from Columbia that uh, Brett Anderson was the first author. And again, it was a single center series. It's probably more relevant for uh, countries that are higher resourced as well as those with fee-for-service medicine, which is very different in our United States than in other places. But when uh, when Brett looked at, there were very, I think there were two mortalities in the entire series. So what Brett looked at was on the y-axis, the probability of a major morbidity 
and looked at various groups that had an arterial switch operation by birth weight, as you can see up here, by weekday admission, by weekend admission, and all of the curves had the same signal with the lowest risk of major morbidity occurring on the third uh, post-birth day. We'll keep that number in mind as we look at this group from uh, Milwaukee. And Milwaukee showed, uh, they had a group of, um, I think this was about um, 70, yeah, 70 patients, excuse me, in the first two weeks of life and broke them down into three age groups. So 70 neonatal arterial switch operations, looking at charges for the hospital. And clearly the longer one waits for surgery, and that may be for reasons such as necrotizing enterocolitis or other reasons, but clearly the longer you're in the hospital in the United States, the more your bill is. And uh, I'm not going to get into the politics behind this because we can, <laughs> we can discuss that all the time. So when we look at all these papers, younger agent repair is not associated with worse outcomes for any measure of morbidity that we can find. But what we do know is the longer you stay in an intensive care unit with transposed physiology, where 90% of the systemic blood flow is the recirculated systemic venous return. Anything that happens in the systemic venous return is going to affect the potential for brain injury, et cetera. What I like to call vein to brain. And the nurses do a great job of trying to remove these uh, potential air emboli, but this is a very abnormal circulation. And the longer one stays with this circulation, the worse it is for the brain. So Dan Licht has done some of the really seminal work in this area, both showing that cerebral blood flow is low as we wait in the intensive care unit, that babies with transposition and other lesions uh, have immature brains at birth. And then this recent work uh, by one of his colleagues, Jennifer Lynch and this large group at, at Children's in Philadelphia, which I think shows some really interesting data using some optical technique. On your left, you can see this is not just a NEARS probe, but a deep optical technique while the baby is feeding. And the top graph shows that the oxygen saturation to the brain, the venous side, goes down every day. This is over five days. And oxygen extraction goes up every day. So we're talking about it's safer. It's not worse to operate early but the brain doesn't like it if you operate later. And the brain doesn't like, and the gut doesn't like it if you operate later, especially if you're on prostaglandin. And then the last one I'll show you here is that the Chris Pettit's work early on, again, trying to sort out this issue of stroke and white matter injury and whatnot. Uh, it was clear that the combination of lower set and longer time to surgery, and again, this goes out about five uh, days, was associated with white matter injury to the brain. Um, last thing I wanna say is the group from Toronto here. Um, what, they, what they did as we did many years ago uh, was repair transposition with ventricular septal defect later in life, two weeks, four weeks, even as long as two months. And although it was safe to wait for transposition, what Mike Seed and the group showed is that there was no brain growth in the period of time of waiting, an average of some of these, some of the late repairs were out to two months. The average here was only 14 days. That was by MRI. So they felt that um, older aged arterial switch impaired brain growth, aged surgery and duration of open chest are associated with slower language development as kids get older. As in every series, length of stay is associated with longer term problems. They speculated that expediting surgical repair could be uh, neuroprotective. Um, oh, I, oh, I found this recently. I, I, was, I didn't know that this paper was published and I found it recently. This is 67 adults who had the arterial switch operation 25 years ago. Uh, so surgery in between 1984 and 1995, the very early days of the arterial switch operation, a third of them had a VSD. The median age of surgery was seven days, nine days in the ICU, and about a month in the hospital. So fairly similar to what we see here. But what was fascinating is not only were the scores in transposition, 
lower than expected as shown in these bars here. So the transposition bars are here, and these are the proportion of patients with problems in IQ, about a third, problems uh, in uh, verbal reasoning and nonverbal reasoning. And this has been reported in multiple series. That wasn't all that new and unique, but what was interesting that risk factors for worse intellectual function operated 25 years ago was older age at surgery. Risk factors for higher anxiety scores, older age at surgery. Now we're talking about differences between days and predictors of higher depression scores. Interestingly, was the absence of a balloon, a balloon atrial septostomy. So it turns out that decisions we make in the intensive care unit now may have implications for the next two to three decades. We know that babies and longer probably, babies with transposition have immature brains after birth cerebral blood flow is low, oxygen uh, delivery decreases daily, extraction increases daily, the longer time to surgery increases risk, balloon atrial septostomy increases risk of stroke. Um, it, Balloon atrial septostomy, as shown in Boston, doesn't predictably, predictably determine whether you can close the duct and have adequate oxygenation. Longer time to surgery is not good for the brain, as we've said multiple times. And shorter time to surgery is not associated with increased mortality or cardiovascular morbidity. So for arterial switch patients, we know that the risk of dying from your operation starts to increase in months but the probability of morbidity starts to increase in days. So we had a town hall recently at uh, Children's National about uh, two months based on a lot of this data to try to come up with an agreed upon protocol uh, for us at Children's National. Um, and you know, we went through these things we just talked about before about um, optimal cost is down in the three to four days, no difference in morbidities risk to the brain, that's my good friend, Melissa Jones, risk to the brain goes up. And we, I think in the absence of complicating factors, obviously low birth weight or congenital anomalies or parents not around or things like that, the optimal age to operate for the arterial switch is certainly by the fourth day of life. Um, this is the recent guidelines from Europe. And I, I would, bring into question here, A, this very complicated um, algorithm, all to get to consider early SO and wait for ASO. And my, uh, my question would be why? So this is now our very simple diagram. Start prostaglandin, confirm the anatomy, balloon if necessary, have the parents hold the baby, feed the baby, evaluate the other organs, decrease your venous access, and then operate it less than or equal to three days. Um, this will be shown on the YouTube video, so I'm not going to go through it, but our approach is what day is the baby, of, is the baby born? So today is Tuesday. So we would say if a baby was born today in our unit, we would say to the families and to the team, surgery is scheduled for Friday, Thursday if you want. Schedule the day of surgery. We will do a septostomy if the baby needs to be intubated, needs a lot of oxygen, or has low cardiac output, or needs vasoactives. Um, and otherwise, just keep the baby on prostaglandin and postpone the surgery if there are problems, rather than waiting for stability and then stable and then scheduling surgery. So this is brand new in our center. It may not be right um, for sure. We, it's a testable hypothesis and stay tuned for a couple of years from now once we have uh, some results with this. And maybe as we get to the question part, we can maybe go over that. So this is um, probably a good place to take a break, uh, Grace, if that's okay with you. And maybe answer a few questions. If you have questions that go into the Q&A box. We have uh, uh, two questions actually on the chat box that I saw, just let me find them again. Okay, so this is one interesting question to discuss about TGA when patients with uh, pulmonary hypertension, the risks and the management. Ah, uh, boy, do we, <laughs> I wish there was a simple answer to that. And of course, part of it is why does the baby have PPHN? Mm -hmm. um, we, we've 
all seeing a rare number of these patients. And first, let's talk about the physiology that's problematic. First of all, at least in my experience, most of them are in patients that have an intact atrial septum or virtually intact atrial septum, where there have been in utero pulmonary venous changes of hyper um, muscularity and pulmonary arterial changes. Uh, so that after they're born, uh, they have the anatomic substrate to have abnormal pulmonary uh, reactivity. We see that in other lesions with uh, intact or virtually intact um, atrial septum, particularly those with mitral atresia and hypoplastic left heart syndrome or obstructed uh, total anomalous pulmonary venous return. So having said all of that, uh, without an open ASD, as I've said many times, it's hard to do, uh, it, you can't stabilize these babies. So there's two options with the profoundly sick baby. The first is an urgent septostomy, and the second is ECMO. Uh, and many times, uh, if you don't have, it's whatever you can get that baby on quickest. Most of the times, it's septostomy. The problem with many of these babies, however, is you open up the atrial septum, and you have the baby on prostaglandin, but they still have reduced pulmonary blood flow. And so that's the opposite of what we talked about before. If you don't have a left, when you have a left to right ductus, then you get a lot of pulmonary blood flow and a lot of pulmonary venous return and blood goes from the left atrium to the right atrium. I wish I had a diagram of this. However, when there is a right to left ductus, pulmonary blood flow is decreased. And that means left atrial return is decreased. And therefore the atrial blood tends to go right atrium to left atrium. So the general approach would be keep the ductus open and use pulmonary vasodilators, a safe amount of oxygen and nitric oxide and see if you can reverse the ductal shunt. And the problem then goes from too little pulmonary blood flow to now a wide open ductus with nitric oxide on board, you stop the nitric oxide and then it flips back the other way and you're going back and forth. And this is a difficult decision to make surgically, right? The, the surgical decision then is, do I make the baby pink and treat the baby with ECMO after the operation? Uh, so that's an early arterial switch or do I wait till the pulmonary vascular resistance is less twitchy and then do the arterial switch? Both are very reasonable strategies. I've seen babies go to the operating room quickly and not need ECMO afterwards. Babies who go to the operating room quickly and need ECMO for pulmonary hypertension. Babies that don't go to the operating room quickly and go on ECMO. So that's, the, that's clearly the worst group. There's no definite um, answer on how to do those, and they have to be individualized. They need um, someone sitting at the bedside, quite frankly. Once nitric oxide gets started with an open ductus, those babies can get sick in either direction. So I hope I answered that uh, Now you did question. very well. Uh, it's a tricky patient, for sure. We have... Uh, um more few questions. Uh, one of them is uh, if you in, you, you in your uh, program, do you usually place uh, umbilical lines, arterial and venous to all of these patients or no? Yeah, that's coming from my friend Chris Tirada down in uh, Miami. Thanks for the question. Um, it's uh, many of our, we don't have an in-house birthing unit. So much of what happens with umbilical lines are dependent upon the neonatal ICUs where the babies are born. We recommend just a UV and a UA if possible. Not a lot of peripheral lines, the least venous access possible. If we can't get an umbilical arterial line, then of course we'll use a radial line. Um, and if we can't get an umbilical venous line, we'll try to run just on peripheral IVs until the surgery and a couple of days later. Um, and then put in either uh, internal jugular lines or right atrial uh, RA catheters, Chris. Um, but I, I think we've gone from the just-in-case IVs in transposition to a good solid central line and not a lot of other IVs and then fix the transposition circulation so you don't have all the potential vein-to-brain risks. Perfect. 
We have a and question. then uh, I think uh, we also have another question about uh, target atrial uh, target oxygen saturations. Um, you can see on the on the slide that I've left up here is um, you know is the ox is the amount of oxygen more toxic than doing the septostomy. Um, and of course, the oxygen saturations are rarely stable, right? So what typically happens is a baby who's doing okay, let's say saturation of 80%, who then cries and intermittently dips down into the 60s to 70s. That does not bother me um, all that much for a couple of reasons. Cardiac output is preserved. So if cardiac output is preserved, if 60% of the blood is saturated, for the most part, oxygen delivery is fine. These, as fetuses, these babies have cerebral oxygen saturations in the 40s. So if they're not anemic and don't have a high oxygen consumption, I'm generally okay with saturations in the 70s, 70s to 80s. Now, I'm... Uh, again, you'll have other people at your institution that will do it differently. But I think the question you have to ask yourself based on the uh, data that I showed you before, let's say that baby is having these oxygen saturations where you are tonight. And let's say that that is um, uh, a Tuesday where you are and you're thinking about a balloon septostomy. If you can, why not just do the operation first thing tomorrow morning? and see if you can get that baby stabilized rather than increasing the risk. And this is a discussion the medical team and surgical team should have. And then for the other question that just popped up, yes, we do recommend treating transposition VSD exactly the same as transposition in tax septum, mainly because of the risks of the transposed physiology and the, the growing data that delaying the operation is not good. We have three questions about how do you approach the preemie? Very carefully. <laughs> um, so what would be uh, the goal? You weigh them to have the two kilos, 2.5 kilos, a particular gest gestational age? Uh... Um, you know, there's no, I wish there was a good answer to that. You know, if I say 2.5 kilos, for, I'm making that number up, by the way. If I say 2.5 kilos, is 2.4 really different than 2.5? No. Um, so th the way I tend to think about it is what ICU risks are accumulating by waiting to surgery. And if surgery will reduce those risks and it doesn't change the mortality risk all that very much, then we would just go ahead and operate. The problem, of course, is that very low 1600 gram birth weight baby where if you do a septostomy, vascular access is challenging. If you leave a ductus, it, we know that an open duct with a structurally normal heart in a 1600 gram baby has its problems. There's no good answer for that. So in general, we will try to delay uh, surgery as long as the delay is not um, running a lot of mortality. So for example, if delay means the baby needs hyperalimentation, that's one thing. If delay means a baby is um, uh, on a ventilator and inotropic infusions and prostaglandin, then that's a whole different story. Now we're getting lots of questions. I have one question from my side. Yes, uh, go. So you're, you're talking about delaying surgery for the preemies. What about the patients who, are, who have symptomatic brain injury? For example, a patient that uh, was waiting for surgery for four days, he started to have seizures, he was sent to the MRI. There are a lot of ischemic changes in the brain. Is it safe to send them on to bypass? Should you wait the, I don't know, two weeks, four weeks? So how, how do you deal with patients yeah. with uh, uh, brain injury? Yeah, the biggest concern is not the white matter injury, but strokes or subdurals yes. that may extend or have hemorrhagic transformation. And, um, you know, I, we go based on our neuro colleagues and we have to base also the hemodynamics. If, if the baby's hemodynamics are good with no prostaglandin and a native, <laughs> a native ASD, then you wait. Uh, sometimes you have to bite the bullet and just go early. Uh, but we try to wait five to seven days if at all okay. possible. Okay. Um, would I prefer prostaglandin in a central line or peripheral line? I, 
I prefer, I generally recommend prostaglandin in the most secure line you have. I don't, if I've got two peripheral IVs, I don't know if I would start a central one for that particular reason. Um, but again, all these questions, I can, I'm looking at all of these questions. These are all questions that come up because we haven't done the arterial switch. And they're all great questions. And most of them go away if you, if you do the arterial switch. I'll ask the, the last two, if that's okay, Grace, and then I can type the rest. Yes, sure. We had to pay a complete, complete transposition, septostomy, then prostaglandin, developed low output. Um, yeah, that, so again, that's the problem of an open ductus, right? If you have an open ductus uh, and they're in very low systemic pulmonary vascular resistance, um, your options are at that point to either do the arterial switch in a sick patient uh, or do what you did, which is ductal closure. It's an unusual case, but certainly can happen. Um, as far as this, oh, here we go. If you have to intubate a TGA baby after the septostomy, um, do, 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 uh, do, do, do. yeah, these are all sort of, um, there are excellent questions. So if you have to intubate a baby, so I'm imagining that you have to intubate a baby for hypoxemia as opposed to apnea. So there's two different reasons that you might want to do that. Um, but basically, I'm a big fan of less is more. So if you, uh, if you intubate the baby for apnea and then do the septostomy, I would absolutely try to take that tube out again, even if it's for a day before surgery. Leaving a baby intubated is irritating and all sorts of problems with that. Um, if you did a septostomy at two in the morning and you're going to get your switch in six hours, probably not. But in general, if, um, if a baby's uh, oxygen delivery is normal and they don't need a breathing tube, let's take out the breathing tube. That's the way I would approach that. Perfect. Amazing discussion. Thank you, Gil. I think we can move forward. Okay. And we're going we're gonna to do the next half an hour and then we'll, uh, we'll wrap up with the last questions. Okay. Perfect. Guys, please continue to type your questions. This is very interesting. We are very happy to discuss. They're great questions. And many of them are the same questions that have come up over and over in many different places. And uh, please remember that these are just Gil's opinions. There is a lot of, a lot of different ways to do this, but uh, I'll certainly give you whatever my opinion might be, however, <laughs> however wrong it might be. Um, okay, so let's go to um, just to summarize um, what to expect in the perioperative care. Uh, following a, an arterial switch operation. I'm going to talk about the immediate postoperative assessment. The, I love the term that I heard at Cincinnati Children's, the flight plan or the roadmap or the expected postoperative course for the heart, the lungs, uh, and then other ways of treating the babies in the ICU. These are diagrams from Children's Hospital of Philadelphia's website. Um, they're really some of the best uh, descriptions I've seen of this operation. Um, and the families that I've referred to from every institution find them very helpful. So for all of us that are not surgeons, the arterial switch operation is basically a three-step procedure. So and the surgeons are going to be mad at me for this. But so here's our transposed aorta in the front that's been transected over here. The, the coronary arteries are removed on buttons of tissue. And the pulmonary artery, as you can see here, is in the back. The pulmonary artery is moved anteriorly. The coronary arteries, that's a, a Lecompte maneuver, which I'll show you some examples of later. The coronary arteries are re-implanted into the aorta, sometimes above, but shown here below the suture line, reconnecting the new aorta. And then finally, the arterial switch operation is complete here. And so I wanna point out here, this is the picture I always show our staff in our cardiac ICU with this suture line and this suture line and this suture line and then this posterior uh, coronary artery back here, which is always the one that wants to bleed. And this post, so if you've got bleeding back here, you've got to take down this entire anterior Lecompte maneuver to get back and fix that bleeding. So this surgical anastomosis here is the one that we have to be particularly mindful of. It's under high pressure. And that's why the most important challenge after this operation is bleeding. Uh, meticulous attention to hemostasis 
uh, is important in the operating room. The second most common complication is bleeding. Uh, and then the third one is bleeding. So I, I hope that I can make my point here for uh, not only what goes on in the OR, but very um, important to control the systemic blood pressure and potential cares for the baby that may transiently raise the blood pressure, particularly if the conversation that you've had with your surgical colleagues was that this was a particularly challenging area to keep dry. So it's not only what happens in the OR, but certainly what happens in the first 24 hours in the intensive care unit, being very mindful about blood pressure and not letting it be particularly elevated. The second part of our assessment, once we get uh, hemostasis under control, is do we have adequate coronary perfusion? There's a couple of ways to tell that. The first is what the surgeon and anesthesiologist tells you at the end of the case. Did the baby, uh, these are terms in English, I don't know how well they'll translate, but did the baby jump off bypass or sort of limp off bypass? Did the anastomosis have to be redone a little bit with a tacking suture? And these, these details are so important to be transmitted from the surgeon and the surgical team to the ICU. If those are kept secret, it never helps anybody. So if a, you know, we ask everybody to be honest in what they do with these patients. Unfortunately, I've seen sometimes the surgeon say, I fixed it, or maybe tells the attending physician but the bedside staff doesn't know that there was a problem or the left coronary needed to be redone. And then that information doesn't get tra gets, um, transferred from shift to shift. So what went on in the operating room, not only for transposition, but for all of these lesions is crucial for the entire team and why structured handoffs are so important. So the most common challenge is you just can't come off cardiopulmonary bypass adequately or you need a lot of inotropes or the TEE or transesophageal echo uh, does not look good at the end of the case. So if you hear about that, you have to, like we say in English, my spidey sense is up. I'm, I'm really paying attention to that baby a lot more. But the two things that I would say should call your attention to that baby more than anything else is early postoperative ventricular, or less so atrial arrhythmias. For the most part, these babies should, they can have PBCs here and there, premature single beats, but couplets and triplets or sustained ventricular tachycardia, that needs to call your attention to coronary perfusion. And then ventricular function regionally, uh, regionally. but just poor function could be bad. The 12 lead electrocardiogram, especially if there's a VSD, may not be sensitive or specific enough to tell you there's coronary problems. Um, in my experience, uh, and that, I hate when sentences start out with that because I don't have um, a paper to really back it up. Uh, but what I will say is that um, if you have arrhythmias and the echo doesn't look great and the, paper, the patient's not doing well and your echocardiogram looks like I see flow in the coronaries, that's not enough. Um, depending on your unit, what you can get quicker, most units would go right to cardiac catheterization. And that's certainly, a, uh, I don't wanna say a policy, but something we would do in our unit pretty quickly if a patient is not just doing perfectly as expected. The ventricular ectopy needing more inotropic support. Uh, that's important that you go ahead and uh, investigate the coronaries. Because if the coronaries are a problem, no matter what you do in the unit, that baby's not gonna do well. Um, Transposition and particularly arterial switch has been studied probably more than any post-operative patient group um, in terms of the predicted post-op course. Uh, so this is data from Bristol that looks at the troponin release and you can see troponin release peaks uh, in the first 12 hours or so. It's intact septum and VSD and then starts to go down by 24 hours. Complement is activated rather quickly and then starts to tail down uh, in 24 hours. I'm not going to get into all of these. Um, release of endothelin, which is clearly a pulmonary vasoconstrictor, um, peaks at about six hours. Um, we know that pulmonary function worsens both in terms of uh, respiratory index and the AA gradient. Uh, 
Um, and it seems to be attenuated in the black lines here with hemofiltration. And then some work that was done from the Boston Circulatory Arrest Study. This has been shown nauseatingly too frequently, but um, in our studies of um, thermodilution cardiac output after the arterial switch, 25% uh, of the patients had a very low cardiac index, less than two, and the average patient dropped their cardiac index by a third in that first night after surgery. Um, in addition to cardiac output falling, which is on the bottom, systemic and pulmonary vascular resistance go up. And we, we think we understand the mechanism behind that as complement troponin releases endothelin. And there's some preliminary data coming out of one of my colleagues' labs, uh, Nikki Posnack, I spoke with yesterday, about how some of the plasticizer exposure to the plastics in the bypass circuit may also be adding to some of this response. So more on that to follow, but we do know the observation um, and the kids can look surprisingly good with our normal parameters of measurement. This is data from Tim Hoffman's work on the Primacorp study that looked at the drop in mixed venous saturation. So on the y-axis is the mixed venous oxygen saturation in the first night, which um, the, the um, statistical power was not enough. It, the p-value is 0.07, I think. But as you can see, the signal of high dose milrinone compared to no milrinone that uh, there was, and uh, low dose milrinone here in the middle uh, showed the signal again. All the data is, port is pointing toward the same sort of finding. So what should be our standard of care for these kids? And I get that questions a lot. And there really is no standard. I've learned going from a couple of different institutions now that what I thought was absolutely the right thing to do in Boston didn't work in Philadelphia. And what I thought was the right thing to do in Philadelphia may not have worked in Miami and then et cetera, et cetera. So whatever um, pharmacologic cocktail I use now, I think you should do importantly what works in your unit. So this is uh, data from a multi-center survey that we did on um, utilization of elective delayed sternal closure, uh, essentially always versus occasionally to rarely or never. Um, these are the types of post-operative infusions, uh, milrinone, dopamine, epinephrine. You can see wide variability across different institutions. Uh, this is whether neuromuscular blockade and narcotic analgesia was given intermittent dosing or continuous infusion. Uh, do you monitor with NEARS? And I have to be honest, this was data from hypoplastic left heart syndrome, but I guarantee you, had we asked about arterial switches, it would have been about the same. So what do we do with this, um, with this information? So I think one of the more important things that I tell you is use what works in your unit. There's no reason, unless it's not working, there's no reason for you to change a strategy to what's done at Children's National or CHOP uh, or Bambino Chesu or Sidra. Um, but the general principles still hold. Um, so in our, in our units and places where I've been delayed sternal closure only when necessary, um, as opposed to electively, um, intermittent neuromuscular blockade rather than continuous neuromuscular blockade, continuous analgesia rather than intermittent. I, I've had good experience with fentanyl and increasing uh, experience with dexmedetomidine and Repressidex. It's a centrally acting alpha blocker. Um, in units I used to work in, uh, dopamine was common. We typically use epinephrine here. One is not better than the other, although some of the lab data would suggest epinephrine is, uh, produces sort of less oxygen consumption in the myocardium compared to dopamine. Uh, we do use milrinone. Uh, we don't load in Washington, the same way we loaded in Philadelphia, but we do use Norina, at least that's been studied in a randomized clinical trial. Um, the continuous monitoring in our unit includes a left atrial line, a right atrial line, or jugular line. It's uncommon for us to use a PA catheter, a continuous ECG, Foley, and tidal CO2, and we'll get to the electroencephalogram in just a second, and then intermittent monitoring of lab values uh, and a daily chest radiograph for the first few days. That's what we do at Children's National. It's probably different. Grace, I don't know if you're still on. What, what do you do in, uh, in Sidra? Is that very different where you are? 
No, it's uh, pretty much the same. Uh, we are not. We are starting to use intracardiac lines now. We were before using jugular, but now we are shifting to intracardiac, for, especially for the single ventricles. Not only on the TGA, but for the mm -hmm. single ventricles, and the monitorization is the same. We have, and we use NIRS. We use NIRS for these patients. Okay, I, I should have um, should have done one of those survey questions to ask the audience. We yeah. have almost two hundred people on now. It's ironic that we've gone from using intracardiac lines now using. IJ lines. So okay. centers just move around and it's more preference of the OR team than anything else. So use what works in your unit. And now let's close up with a couple of things about pattern recognition. Um, what about arrhythmias? I said, be nervous when you see arrhythmias, especially after an arterial switch operation. And this was work in Philadelphia a number of years ago now, where we looked at all sorts of uh, operations that came into our unit. 20% um, 15 out of, out of this, I forget what the denominator was, had non-sustained VT uh, and 20% uh, had SVT. So balancing, do you calf everybody with VT? Uh, I don't know, but if you start to get VT and you're on a little more inotropes and the echo doesn't look good, absolutely. Um, Larry Rhodes also looked at this in Boston about 10 years earlier. This was um, arterial switch patients here, 189 of them and 136 over there on the right. Uh, and this was on a discharge halter. So half of them have some ventricular ectopy and 10% have couplets. So this becomes a somewhat challenging decision. And I don't want people to go away from today's webinar saying, oh, I saw a ventricular couplet, we have to have a hard calf. But it should be high on your list to consider. Um, this was um, for many different types of operations, but again, to show you the time course that PVCs and PACs start to occur 48 and 72 hours. When, when you see it here and the kid is otherwise progressing normal, I think that that's fine and can be basically just watched. However, if you see ectopy, PVCs that first day or that first night, over in this area over here. And that's what's so rare in, uh, in this paper from, um, um, I, I don't know, I, I'm sorry, I'm forgetting which institution was, uh, was, and they're probably on the call, but I appreciate that. Uh, but good data. Late arrhythmias are common. First 24 hours, worry about the coronaries. Couple other things. So this is just a comparison. I, I don't have the, the um, transposition data separated from the hypoplast data. The data in pink is babies that have had a switch. The data in blue is babies who've had a Norwood. Um, the top ones, the pink ones are in Boston. The blue ones are in Philadelphia. And the similarities are very are striking, even though two very different operations and two very different post-op physiologic states. But urine output is generally not as good on that second post-operative day back in these, in this day. Fluid balance then doesn't start to. All patients have a depression in their white blood cell count and in their platelet count by the second or third day as the trauma that the cells undergo being exposed to bypass then get removed from the hematopoietic system. In other words, the platelets become dysfunctional right away, but they get removed by the spleen over the next 48 hours. And that's why the platelet count tends to be lower on the second or third post-operative day. What about our other organ systems, lungs, kidneys, and brain? A couple things just to mention to those of you who are working in the unit. Um, first of all, pulmonary hypertension, which was asked about before in the preoperative patients, it does, the risk for that doesn't go away. And babies that have um, arterial switch, even as neonates, um, some proportion of them, probably two to three to 5%, will have a lack of fall of pulmonary vascular resistance and need long-term therapy with anti-pulmonary hypertensive agents. The etiology is not clear. Back in the 80s and 90s, all of the babies that were operated on in Boston had a one-year post-op calf. And we were surprised at the severity of these bronco aortopulmonary collaterals. These are true bronchial arteries. These are not like the major aorticopulmonary collaterals that we see with tetralogy. These are hypertrophied bronchioles. And the first clue that this may be there for the patient 
is what the surgeon sees in the operating room. Now, a lot of times the surgeons will say on bypass with the ductus ligated, there is still a lot of left atrial return. Where is that left atrial return coming from? It's coming from these bronchial arteries. Sometimes, uh, when we saw a case of this recently, baby flew off bypass, but then had a significant right upper lobe pulmonary hemorrhage. And nearly all of these um, vessels go to the right for reasons that I don't understand. Um, and we see them a lot uh, in the uh, one-year post-op cath. As you can see in this uh, paper we wrote, this is got almost 20 years ago. This finding has been repeated it should be kept in mind when kids have wet lungs or are not progressing from a respiratory perspective the way you would expect when you have a switch who's done well, their x-ray doesn't look great. You talk to the surgeon, oh yeah, I had a lot of left atrial return. That baby probably should be considered for cardiac catheterization to coil off and investigate these abnormal vessels. There's some emerging data now that there may, there may be forms of ciliopathies in transposition. So not just heterotaxy or isomerism lesions, but again, this might be worth looking at in some patients with transposition of the great arteries if you have unexpected pulmonary processes in the post-operative period. We know that acute kidney injury uh, can happen in all neonates, and it's about 20% in this uh, excellent manuscript out of Cincinnati uh, after the arterial switch operation. Another paper showed about 51% depending on the criteria. I think the last one was KDGO and this one was the rifle criteria. So whether you use the number 20 or 50% is not as important as you need to be very mindful to avoid nephrotoxic agents in babies that have had a neonatal pump run. And we do know that the higher your uh, peak urea, the longer uh, babies stay in the ICU. And that may also be a reflection of not just management, but a low output state. Um, I, do, I personally don't have a lot of experience with early PD. Um, our surgeons, uh, now Eve Dudekem has joined us from the um, Australian, from the Melbourne School, where a lot of them use PD, and there are probably people on this call that use peritoneal dialysis. Um, I, don't, I just don't have enough experience talking about that, and maybe we can talk about it in the Q&A. Uh, and then uh, an area that we've all been interested in a lot more lately, the brain in transposition. We've already talked about decreased oxygen delivery and brain immaturity and the risk of stroke. And the two-thirds, uh, roughly half the two-thirds have neurodevelopmental childhood. Uh, neurodevelopmental challenges in childhood and 20 to 30% with mood disorders. So we know that there are areas we can improve this on. So the incidence in, of seizures uh, 20 years ago, 20 to 30 years ago, was somewhere around 10% with transposition intact septum and 20% in transposition VSD. And I should add that the average age of, 20, of the 25% was two months rather than newborns. And nearly 90% of those were not visible by the bedside caregivers. In other words, they weren't clinical. They were EEG or electroencephalographic only. And also importantly, none of them occurred in this study, this is a circuitry rest study, before 11 hours. So in terms of monitoring for seizures in this particular study, we knew that we needed to monitor the babies that night, but didn't have to put on an EEG right away after heart surgery. And it was rare that they persisted after 36 hours. And as you might imagine, is the presence of seizures is related in a group um, to poor long-term uh, neurodevelopmental outcomes. That incidence is less now. I think this is from Marion's paper. Um, uh, the group at CHOP has been doing this uh, for a long time. Dr. Name, Dr. Bird may still be on the phone. Uh, also rare to see these seizures before 11 hours in the ICU and also EEG only. Yeah, this is, uh, so here we are um, roughly 20 years later with similar findings except the decreased incidence. And I don't know why we're about to start to publish this, but our incidence in Washington has been considerably less. It's been somewhere in the range of 2% by EEG. Um, so the, I'm not sure how clear this is in those places that the American Clinical Neurophysiology Society actually recommends continuous EEG monitoring after neonatal surgery because seizures are common and subclinical and associated with worse long-term outcomes. So we have adopted a continuous monitoring full montage 
EEG, the 16 to 20 leads. There is increasing experience with the automated EEG, sometimes four leads, sometimes six, uh, and standby for outcomes based on that. So here's our roadmap or our flight plan. So let's say we have a baby who had an arterial switch operation today. So we would expect tonight and tomorrow a risk of low cardiac output and maybe some oliguria. The risk of arrhythmia and seizures is in this time frame. We would see on Thursday and Friday, maybe a fall in the white blood cell count and platelets. Then we have irritability and pain getting better, urine output and feeding improving over time. Um, and the key behind that, and I would recommend for all of the people on the call to design the roadmap that is typical at your center. It may not be the same one that I just showed you. Um, but if you know what is expected, the most important thing that we do is if your patient is not following the expected course, figure out why and figure it out early. And we've talked about a number of things. Did the cardiologist make an accurate and complete diagnosis? Was a muscular VSD missed? Or are there large um, bronchial collaterals, for example? Is there residual surgical disease, of course, with a lot of sutures, as you saw around there. We talked about the collaterals. Is there a diaphragm that's weak from uh, surgery in the left hilum? Same, excuse me, same thing with uh, vocal cord paralysis. And then the last thing I want to do, just really quickly for those of you who may do outpatient care, the arterial switch is not an anatomical correction. If you look at that picture down at the bottom, it's the anatomical pulmonary valve and root that has to function in the systemic circulation. And two thirds of those sinuses have had incisions in coronary reimplantation. So the neo aortic valve is not an anatomic aortic valve. It has pericardial patches in it. and both pulmonary arteries, as I'm gonna show you a couple of pictures of that, um, are anterior to the um, neo aorta. And that causes compression on the aorta and pulling on the um, Arteries. This is a lateral view, and you could see how normally when the baby is born, the pulmonary artery is back here posteriorly. So, uh, this is on your right is the sternum, on your left is the spine, head is at the top, feet are at the bottom. And the Lecompte maneuver basically drapes the pulmonary arteries almost like the pulmonary arteries are giving a hug to the aorta. And these are some pictures that were loaned to me by, um, let me see if this works here the group in um, uh, Marie Lang Long. And you could see as you look down from the top how the pulmonary arteries sort of drape, I'll play through that one more time, drape directly across the aorta and where the coronary arteries have been re-implanted. So this area right here in the middle is where all the action happens, where the pulmonary arteries push posteriorly and sit on top of the neo-aortic root. So you could also call it a nutcracker um, in that that fixation of the pulmonary arteries pulling backwards over the neo aorta, in my view, is partially responsible for this dilation of the neo aortic root. What's happening right here is that cavity right here is the pulmonary arteries. They sit right here and they pull backwards. So when the ventricle ejects, there's distension that stops at the suture line in the pulmonary arteries and gradually the aortic root dilates. Uh, here's another picture of um, an MRI. Let me see. Okay, so here's the pulmonary arteries after the Lecompte maneuver. That's from the back. Uh, so now what I'm going to do, there's slight cranial angulation. Here's steeper cranial angulation. Now we're looking basically down from the neck. And what sits in that hole? The aortic valve. So that's Yves Lecomte down in the bottom right. And, and his, oper his maneuver made this operation survivable without a conduit. But I think we have to start to think about ways to maybe modify that. And I think that the Japanese spiral approach may be the way to go. All of these things require long-term follow-up. The coronaries, the great vessel anastomosis and the root. Um, here's a good, uh, not a good example, but here's an example of stenosis of the left main coronary artery. Here's one on the right main. This is from Ron Tunnell's work, where the incidence of asymptomatic coronary problems was about 5%. Um, 
Carlos Pedro found the same using uh, intravascular ultrasound. Uh, you can see again, this compression from the anterior pulmonary arteries, which looks in many ways like children that are born with an abnormal with a coronary from the wrong sinus. And, you know, we've identified these things now, but what do they mean? Um, we're making coronaries look like this in newborns. And we say, okay, we're fine. But what's going to happen when these kids get older? Um, I think this is the same one. Yeah, here's, a, here's another one. Look, look at the root. The, the circumflex comes from the right in the back. This valve here can't function like a normal aortic valve. And so here's where we are, right? So the arterial switch operation is 30 years old. The graph that I've shown is when you get coronary disease from atherosclerotis, bad genes, your diet, and all that stuff. So the pediatric cardiologists were like, yeah, this is great. This is fine. And the adult congenital cardiologists are also thinking, oh, my 35 to 40 year old arterial switch is doing fine. But I'm, uh, I'm a little unsure what's gonna happen uh, to these children. And I think it's incumbent upon all the pediatric cardiologists to encourage exercise from the very beginning to counsel against obesity from the very beginning. <clears throat> and serially evaluate diet and cholesterol and other things as these patients get older. Because this will come. Aortic valve disease and coronary disease are going to affect these patients, in my view, without question, earlier than patients who have not had an arterial switch operation. Um, I'm going to I forget that part. Um, so we did the knee order. I think what I'll do is I'll stop at this point. Um, so that we have time for questions. The time is uh, 23. So let me see if there, uh, this was, um, uh, I'm doing these really fast. So if anybody wants to see them on the uh, YouTube, you can pause the video. <laughs> uh, that's aortic insufficiency. Um, this is elevated pulmonary vascular resistance in many of the patients who've had a neonatal arterial switch. You can see here. And that was my last slide, but I wanted to have enough time for questions. I, I've given you a grand tour of transposition. Um, and it looks like we have some questions, Grace. Do you want to moderate them through? Or? Yeah, we have a, a, a lot of questions and I'm very happy for that. And Gil, just to let you know, the feedback that I already got from your talk is awesome. People are already texting me saying that this has been very practical and very well explained and people are able to understand a lot of things. And I think people are going to be able to change their practice for something better, hopefully. So I'm very happy for that. Thank you. Thank you. That's kind of you to say, but please, when you make a change, please measure it and be sure it's better <laughs> and report it. So uh, we have a couple of questions. Well, we have more than that. We have several questions. There's one question, very simple one, uh, asking why jugular and not femoral on your lines? Well, part of it is that in Bratislava, they don't have uh, jugular. I'm sorry, Martin. I'm just, I'm just kidding. Thanks for the question from the Slovak Republic. Um, I, I, it's, it's a tough question. I, I think in our transposition, <laughs> what does that say? Surgeon what? Lovely Comte. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, so do the interventional cardiologists when they have to dilate the pulmonary yes, artery. Yes, you place a stent on that. I know and, that. Uh -huh. that's, that's the partial answer to um, Martin's question, right? Which is, we don't want to lose vascular access from below. Um, but in general, I think a central access is crucial early after surgery and crucial to remove as soon as possible. And you move these kids forward to minimize the uh, any of the any of the complications. Chris Tarota, thanks for your kind words. <laughs> so we have one question uh, asking about LA line. You already said that uh, you most of your patients come uh, from the OR with LA line, right? Um, it's surgeon dependent. I think if the um, if the kids jump off bypass and uh, had no problems with the coronary switch and the function looks good, they may not leave the LA line in. They may measure the pressure and remove it. Um, it's, uh, it really is an individual thing, but I would say um, the most, that most of them do come back with an LA line. 
Okay, there's one question that I'm wondering uh, if uh, Nabil is still around, if he could explain why he would think about that. And he's saying that after a uh, balloon atrocytostomy, if the patient is off prostin and extubated, can we send him to the ward if the surgery is in the next week? Uh, well, the first thing I would do is wonder why the surgery is the next week. Yes, but, that's, but, that what, but, uh, that's my rational. But, but, if, but there, there are many good reasons for that. That's fine. I'm, that I don't want to talk about. So that really depends upon your ward and what type of monitor you have. There's no right or wrong answer for that. Okay, what's the optimal timing for extubation on the post-op? As rapidly as possible. There's a group actually, there's a group that is doing them on the table now in the operating room. Um, and, you know, we, um, I think what has to, what needs to be, you know, we know that we know about this low output state, right? The thing that I want people to remember is 70% of the babies do not have a low output state. So we are keeping all babies into the, for the 25% that do. So I hope that we can learn over time, which ones are not going to have low output and fast track them. So, so this all start, if you have a unit that wants to, ext let's say you did the operation today and you wanna, you wanna extubate say tomorrow morning or tonight, then that means you must work together with your anesthesia team so that the anesthetic that's given isn't deep, long-term narcotic 50 mics per kilo of fentanyl because you may want to extubate, but the child may not breathe. But in general, all the data that I showed you about troponin, uh, cardiac output, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and a good repair normalizes in 24 hours. They're back to baseline in 24 hours. So there shouldn't, you know, intensivists are great. We like to start stuff and then wean stuff. We don't start stuff and stop stuff, right? So usually if a kid has an arterial switch, what I will do the next morning when I walk by is turn their drips off. And I got this from Tom Spray, who used to say, turn everything off, take everything out, extubate. Once you get through that 24 hours, now all that stuff, the medicines, the breathing tube, the central lines have more risk than benefit. So if you've gotten to 24 hours, move. That's a long answer to a question of what's the optimal time to extubate. But I, I think the same for all, all of that. When do you remove the RA line? When do you take the Foley out? When do you stop the medicines? As soon as possible. Perfect. Now, uh, Sasha's patients all have perfect operations. That, that I know. Um, <laughs> he's like, yes, of course. Yes. What, what, what's your policy in, uh, in terms of weaning things and all that stuff in, uh, in Bambino Gesù? <clears throat> yes, in Bambino Gesù, generally, we leave an ASD. So we don't use, uh, as usual, the left atrial uh, lines. So generally, we, we leave uh, the chest one night open, the, the, the night of the surgery. Of course, we try to close the day after. We start with uh, looking to troponin, but we understand that in 24 hours, troponin will uh, normalize in a non-complex case. So we stop sedation uh, in uh, on day one after the closure of the the chest and generally we are able to extubate in day two or day three. Again, what's great about that is there's a roadmap for Sasha's patients. Uh, it's different than mine, that, that's okay. But that roadmap is what you then have to use to say, okay, am I different or the same from all of these? What, how about in, uh, in Sidra or in, uh, in Sao Paulo? What, what has been your experience, Chris? Yeah, we don't extubate in the OR. We hope that one day we'll be able to do that. But we do, we, all, all the chest is closed unless there's something uh, that prevents us to close the chest. And we try to, usually we, we think about extubating next day, but we extubate usually day two. And all of them uh, usually are on Mirinon and low dose epi. I should have made those slides. It would have been nice to pull the audience. Uh, I'll yeah, do that for the next one. Yeah. yeah, I didn't have time to do that. We have All one right. question uh, regarding arrhythmias. Uh, our colleague is saying that the most uh, common uh, arrhythmia that he sees on these patients are AV block. That's 
I think on that slide that you showed, it was not the most common one. And he's asking about the time for the permanent pacemaker. It's interesting because it's not my experience to see a lot of uh, complete heart blocks on these patients. Yeah, it's, it hasn't been mine as well. However, um, I think the data would be the same for this as for any V. I'm assuming it's with VSD closure. Yeah. Um, uh, generally, if the AV conduction hasn't come hasn't come back by the first week, ten days maybe, um, is when a permanent pacemaker could go in. The only caveat to that is if the thresholds on your temporary wires are getting worse, you have to do it a little bit earlier. Do you recommend the sildenafil as a routine on the pulse op? No. Okay. Well, no, it's funny that it's funny. It's funny that I just said that so casually. <laughs> um, I do recommend norinone post op, and I did say that pulmonary vascular resistance goes up thirty seven percent. So why am I not using sildenafil? It's a great question. I'm going to have to think about that. It's, it's worth uh, looking at. <laughs> Nor Sildenafil and nitric is more known for the right heart. So sure. maybe that would be a, a reasonable thing to think about. Thank you for a good idea. I'm going to think about that. And there's one question about uh, nitroglycerin, if you use it as part of your post-op care. I, ha I have not. I know there's other centers that have used it. That's in their post-operative um, cocktail. Um, I don't know if denervated coronaries, which is what transposition is, would have the same response to, um, uh, oh, someone is using routine sildenafil. Good. I want, I want to find out about what that's like. Um, I, another question along those lines is I do not know if patients after an arterial switch can feel angina or chest pain if they have a coronary problem because the aortic root has been transected. So for all you adult cardiologists or ACHD people out there, chest pain may not be a reliable indicator, something to think about. Adrian um, is asking about uh, lymphatic uh, injury or abnormal lymphatic system. If we, or how is your experience with patients yeah, on PGA? I've seen a, a couple patients and in all, maybe three, two were lethal actually. Um, the problem was at the SVC, that the SVC cannulation site was narrow. I haven't seen any patient with abnormal lymphatics in isolation. Now, I'm sure that happens. I just haven't come across one of those. But if you have chylothorax, then you've got to figure out if it's hemodynamic or traumatic. If it's hemodynamic, which is a high central venous pressure, uh, you do a calf, you see what it is, be sure the SVC is not obstructed. We've had a baby recently with a big clot in the innominate vein. On the other hand, if it's traumatic from the thoracic duct, then the surgeon has to do like. Okay. And what's the etiology of the seizures on the pulse up? Um, not entirely clear. Uh, okay. Like many things, it's multifactorial. Um, we know what is associated with it which is younger gestational age, um, longer pump times. But there are patients at term with short pump times who also seize. So it's, um, it's, a, it's a tough question. It's a good answer. I hope that people can investigate that. There's one question about uh, nitric oxide. What's the best time to start it on TGA, VSD, pulmonary hypertension? I think what he means is that if you start prophylactically, when the, the patients come from OR, doesn't matter uh, what happens, you start then on nitric or you wait to have some signs of pulmonary hypertension uh, on the post-op to start it? Yeah, it's a great question. And again, in, in centers where, uh, which is the only place I've worked where we operate so early, um, the incidence of hemodynamically important pulmonary hypertension has been essentially zero. Mm -hmm. um, we do know that babies with transposition are more predisposed to uh, pulmonary hypertensive events and for fixed vascular disease than VSD in isolation. You can end up with fixed vascular disease mm -hmm. if you left unrepaired for two months. Um, so I don't really have a great answer to that question. Miguel is making a comment, and in the end, he has an interesting uh, question about the coronary uh, abnormalities of the, the patients with uh, TGA. He says that uh, if there are injury or significant stenosis when one of the coronary arteries, is there collateral flow to compensate that myocardial perfusion? 
Yeah, great question. So the, in the catheterization studies that have been done, and there's three large studies that now have shown this, asymptomatic kids can have occlusion or stenosis with good collateralization. And I think what happens is they're entirely asymptomatic and have an uneventful post-op course, and it happens so gradually that the coronaries become collateralized. But there have been many kids that we've now seen um, who have trouble uh, as described in the questions and need to go on ECMO right away. The collateralization, in, I think, would not occur in a, in a short enough time to then be able to come off bypass. And if, if the surgeons, if the coronary patterns are so challenging that they can't be switched, uh, it's probably unfortunately a lethal complication. Okay, let me see what else. We oh, Luba's, Luba's got a great question from Slovakia, but I think I was there, Luba, or maybe, maybe not about the first DTGA operated in Slovakia. Oh, um, <laughs> no cell phones. Oh, God, I miss those days. That's right. I think we did a septostomy on that kid in the middle of the night. The, the group in Bratislava are such great friends. Yeah, thanks, thanks for that, Luba. We, uh, so that patient now is um, 18. Wow. And we're not any older. That's awesome. <laughs> no questions from Plymouth. I'm disappointed. And uh, there's one question from the anesthesiology group in uh, Ukraine. I think uh, the group that you you were talking about on, on that uh, paper that you showed, and they agreed that the bleeding is a, a, a major problem, and they are asking about AKI on the post op. How, how is your experience? How do you manage? Yeah, the, the, I think the fundamental problem, hey, Luba, <laughs> the fundamental problem is that um, um, the nephrons, the, the neonatal kidney is fundamentally immature. It's not necessarily a problem with the surgeon. However, if there is a low output state superimposed on immature nephrons and tubules, you will get AKI. So we use the usual maneuvers to maximize um, cardiac output um, and to uh, minimize gentamicin and you know, any of the other things, vancomycin that may be nephrotoxic. Um, that's about it. Um, uh, we're starting to use more PD in my center, so. Okay. And you don't use PD as a routine. They don't come from the OR routinely with the PD. Uh, we have the catheter in in many kids, but we and we use it to drain. Okay, we but it, you, you place them on the, on the OR usually, but as a routine. Yeah. And, and that's, um, I've been doing this for almost 30 years. I have experience now in three years with it, so I can't, <laughs> I can't really say. Okay. <laughs> Thank you for the kind comment from Plymouth, I appreciate that. I'm trying to keep up with all these questions. Now, I think we had a, a very, very uh, good session. Uh, there's one uh, last question about uh, about aortic regurgitation that I think is most on the late post-op and the need of surgery. Uh, how do you see that? Yeah, so it depends on how you define AI. So virtually all the patients have Doppler evidence of AI. Maybe a quarter of them have audible aortic insufficiency. I never know, to be honest with you, from my generation, what to do with mild versus mild to moderate versus moderate. Mm -hmm. um, so echo is a little bit hard for me. I do know that, you know, I know a regurgitant fraction of 10% and, and a normal LV volume, I look at very differently than a regurgitant fraction of 25% by MRI. Um, and so that gets to the um, answer of your question is how many of need surgery? The need for aortic valve surgery is directly proportional to duration of follow-up. So as we follow these patients longer, that incidence will go up. 10 years ago, when we used to talk about this stuff, there were one or two case reports. Now every case report has one or two patients. And I think that number is going to go up uh, higher as we move forward. So just like in us that have structurally normal heart, I imagine have structurally normal hearts, coronaries and aortic valve disease and ascending aortic disease are going to be the Achilles heel of this operation. Okay. It's better than ascending or a mustard, but it's still not, it's still not fixed. <laughs>
Perfect. Is there a weekend effect that should prevent us from operating TGL? Certainly, and I know in Sasha's program, they operate on Saturdays and Sundays. That's so unit specific. <laughs> I, um, I think a baby shouldn't be um, punished is too strong a word. A baby shouldn't get the optimal approach because of the day of the calendar they were born on. So I, you know, Wednesday is probably the toughest day uh, because Saturday and Sunday will be the days when it's probably the best time to do it. Um, but in many places, bringing in a team off uh, hours uh, into a unit that may not be staffed as well has to be balanced into that. And we have less attending coverage in our unit, like most places on a Saturday or a Sunday. Um, and, you know, it's, uh, there are other balancing equations here. But Adrian, I agree with you. I, it's interesting because it's uh, really some things are really center specific or region specific. For you, the worst, uh, the most difficult day for the patient to be born is on Wednesday because Saturday and Sunday you don't have surgery usually. Here, Sunday is a working day. So for us, a patient who was born on Wednesday is perfect. He's going to be in the beginning of the week, first case in the morning. So right. he would be the lucky one. Right. And Israel, in Israel, that would be on Tuesday into Wednesday. Right. So it's, yep. It's interesting. Okay. No, more, question. Question. no more questions. That's it. That's it. Yeah. Thank you very much, guys. It was oh, very yeah. good. Have, wait, do we have somebody in here from the, from the center in Kiev? Ukraine, yes, from the UK Children's Cardiac Center. Thank you. Thank, this is so great for so many people that have come from so far. I really enjoy it. Very nice. And uh, we see the, the countries on the chat box. Please type your country. We really want you to know. And thank you for all from the Muslim countries because we, I know this is Iftar time and we are on Ramadan uh, uh, this month. So it's very interesting that people even then uh, are joining us on this time and thank you very much. Dr. Gupta is here from Australia. It must be 11 o'clock in the morning. It must be midnight there. Yes, midnight, yes, there, sure. Thank you for joining us. <laughs> All right, we'll see you later, everybody. Take care. It was amazing, Gil, thank you very much. Thank you guys for your participation. And please forward the link on YouTube to your colleagues. I think this was a very nice talk. It's worth everybody to watch. Bye-bye, guys. See you on Thursday for a fetal series. Bye, Gil. Bye, Ray. Sasha, I promise you I'll get that website work done, okay? Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye-bye. <laughs>